everyone, Nvidia's rollout of brand new GPUs continues with the recent arrival of the GTX 1660. Yup, a non-TI version of the graphics card based on the new TU116 Turing based processor. Think of this one as a kind of hybrid of the TI and the Pascal based 1060 and you'll have some idea of what Nvidia is cooking up here. So to put it simply, although based on the Turing architecture, you don't get the hardware accelerated ray tracing or machine learning features of the RTX line. So in that sense, it's similar to the 1660 Ti, but with this cheaper offering, memory bandwidth is cut back as Nvidia trades in the new GDDR6 memory used in its other new cards for plain old G5. Regardless, the firm is claiming a 15% uptick in performance over the GTX 1060, with prices starting at 200 of your UK pounds or 220 US dollars. Unlike the 1060, there are no reference cards for this model, and our third party card for this review is a Gigabyte model. Not quite at MSRP, but not far from it, with just a small 45 megahertz core overclock to set it apart from the base specs. And I'd say that this is actually the kind of card that I prefer for the mainstream. I mean, I just don't see the point of sinking in a ton of extra cash for high-end cooling solutions or metal shrouds and back plates. This kind of product is all about pricing and performance, right? GTX 1660 has a 120W TDP, which means it's fed from just one 8-pin PCI Express input. Meanwhile, on the back here, we have three display ports and an HDMI 2.0. Now this is an interesting choice of outputs and to be honest I would have preferred to see a dual link DVI included too for a card aimed at this price bracket as opposed to overkill on the DisplayPort side of things. Fairly unobtrusive in operation, this card is pretty good overall and you are saving a decent chunk of change opting for this instead of the 1660 Ti. $50 actually. So looking at the specs, let's see how deeply Nvidia has cut here. And on the face of it, the answers are surprising. We're looking at 1408 CUDA cores rather than the 1536 in the TI model, which when combined with the frequencies it has means that the new model has 92% of the shading power. However, the downgrade from GDDR6 to G5 is a lot more significant. From 288 gigabytes per second, we find ourselves at 192 over a similar 192-bit bus. Bottom line though, that's just 66% of the memory bandwidth, and as we shall see, that is significant. Right, so let's see how the 1660 is meant to slot into the existing competitive environment. The old Pascal-based GTX 1060 has been an unmitigated success for Nvidia. In its lifetime, from a sales perspective, it's seen off AMD's RX 480 and its overclocked successors RX 580 and RX 590, but from a performance angle, GTX 1060 is showing its age. Take a look at an AMD friendly game like uh, Battlefield 1. Our benchmark shows the 580 is about 4% faster, while the 590 is a whopping 16% to the better. And the performance differentials in Far Cry 5 are almost the same. The 1060 is just being left behind. In Shadow of the Tomb Raider, AMD is even more dominant with an 11% lead with the 580, rising to 20% with the 590. Now, Nvidia has some precedent here in not concentrating too much on performance in this price tier. And uh, from my perspective, GTX 960 is pretty much the only enthusiast level GPU it's released that I don't particularly rate. And AMD was way ahead there with the 380 and 380X. But clearly, a new product can't come quickly enough for NVIDIA. But more than that, I actually think that NVIDIA has an even more daunting challenge than AMD itself. <laughs> now, I noticed some comments on my Eurogamer review for the 1660 Ti mentioning that, well, they were perfectly happy with their Maxwell era GTX 970. And why not? That thing was a monster in its time easily capable of overclocking to match or indeed exceed 980 performance. Does this card still hold up today then? Well, I decided to find out and you'll see the results for that a little bit further on in the review. So let's see what the lie of the land is with our standard benchmark suite then. And initially I will be focusing on the current competitive landscape. 
And uh, yeah, I'm also going to be including the GTX 1660 Ti so we can see what the cutbacks are and how much extra performance that $50 gives you. Assassin's Creed Odyssey is a title that actually disrupts the narrative that AMD dominates this sector, with the GTX 1060 having a four-point lead over the 590. Compared to the 1060 though, the 1660 delivers 15% more performance, rising to 34% more for the 1660 Ti. The gap between 1660 and its Ti sibling, around 16%. So that's tracking just a touch beneath the increase in cash you'll need to outlay to buy Nvidia's higher end card instead. A promising beginning then, as in terms of launch MSRPs anyway, the 1660 is around $30 lower than the 1060. Battlefield 1 then, and more of a stern workout for the 1660 here, with the RX 590 handing in some great performance here. You can see on the graph lines, that the 1660 effectively delivers the same ballpark performance as its AMD target. Looking at the metrics more closely, Nvidia is a single percentage point ahead. Margin of error stuff basically, in a game that has historically seen uh, decent AMD benefits. Uh, so yeah, the 1660 is on point here. It also delivers a 17 point lead over the old 1060. The cream of the crop in this batch is of course the 1660 Ti. Here it's trending 19% to the better against the non-TI model. These numbers are eerily reflected in Far Cry 5 with the exact same performance differentials, but this is a fascinating one because as you can see with the way the benchmark plays out, the 590 and the 1660 are actually trading blows throughout the bench. Sometimes AMD is faster, sometimes Nvidia. End result is a one point lead for AMD here, but again, margin of error stuff. Here's a quick look at the punishing Ghost Recon Wildlands Ultra setting benchmark. It's a game that runs and looks absolutely fine on high settings, but as you scale up the quality preset ladder, its impact is daunting to say the least. The 590 has a six point lead over the GTX 1060 here, but well, the graphs speak for themselves. The Turing cards are just powering ahead here. Quick look at the two Tomb Raiders next, Rise and Shadow of the Tomb Raider. With Rise, based on an older version of the Crystal Dynamics Foundation engine, RX 590 is behind the 1660 in the first segment of the bench, but the 1660 is faster in the other two. The new Turing card offers 13% more performance over 1060, but only a single point to the better over the 590. Of course, the 1660 Ti, well, that's 17% faster than the 1660. But remember here that in prior Turing tests, Rise of the Tomb Raider has fallen behind just a touch, while the sequel Shadow does a fair bit better. So next up, let's take a look at that. And well, there's a decent turnabout here, as you may expect. Uh, the new card is a whopping 27% faster than GTX 1060 and about 8% to the better compared to the RX 590. What I would say about this one though is that perhaps the results flatter to deceive. Like Rise, the benches are spread across three segments in the game. Yes, the 1660 is a bit faster in the first segment here and it's also a touch faster in the last environment test here. Hop into the second jungle section though and it's party time for Turing, with frame rates that are often 10 frames per second faster between 1660 and 590, something that is not seen elsewhere. 1660 Ti is a bit of a monster here though, 17% faster than the non-Ti card and 25% faster than the RX 590. Turing continues to love Wolfenstein 2 The New Colossus as well. We're not running with variable rate shading here, even though the 1660 supports it. But the new card is 16 points clear of the 590, even without it, with a 49% lead over GTX 1060. Interestingly, you may notice that the TI doesn't have its customary boost over the 1660 here at 1080p resolution. And my guess here, based on some of the stutter, is that we're hitting CPU limits. The TI's lead is a mere 7%. Remember though that VRS isn't active and if it is, Turing tends to deliver around 15% more performance. 
So that's the score really. The 1660 delivers what it needs to deliver at a pretty decent price. It's not a spectacular performance, but it's just fine for 1080p gaming and doubtless with some settings tweaks, it'll do fairly well at 1440p as well. AMD isn't really at the races here with the RX 590, but with so many decent deals on the RX 580, the price to performance ratio works out much better there. It's nice for users to be spoiled for choice, and yes, one of those choices will be the veteran GTX 970. Super cheap used, or maybe you've got one already and see no real need to upgrade. And you know what? There are certain scenarios where your 970 is pretty awesome, and this Crisis 3 bench spells it out. Turing isn't especially performant on uh, certain older game engines, and as you can see here, stock 1660 performance is only a hair faster than the old GTX 980, and by extension, an overclocked 970. And in fact, you can actually make that 970 run even faster with an even more aggressive overclock. Bottom line though, you look at a test like this and the conclusion may be that the 970 still perfectly fine, years on. And yeah, Far Cry 5, you look at this result and the stock 1660 is only around 6 frames per second faster than an overclocked 970. Averaged out across the bench, the new card is 11% to the better than a 970 overclocked. And yes, of course, you can clock up the 1662, though to nowhere near the same degree as the old Maxwell cards. Similar situation here with The Witcher 3, where again, a stock 1660 is only 11% faster than a 970 overclocked. Now, at this point, you might be thinking that you're looking good, but older cards like the 970 have two key challenges, VRAM allocation and support for modern graphics APIs. Assassin's Creed Odyssey eats up both compute and memory like nobody's business. And rather curiously, we found that overclocking the GTX 970 made no difference whatsoever, suggesting that we're heavily VRAM bound here. 1660 is 63% faster, 1660 Ti is 89% to the better. Shadow of the Tomb Raider sees the 1660 deliver a 27 point lead against an overclocked 970, with the Ti taking that up to 48%. And remember the Turing cards might not deliver as much of a monster overclock as the old Maxwell cards, but they can go faster than what we're seeing here. The Nadir has to be Wolfenstein 2. Again, we're not running VRS, variable rate shading, on the Turing models. And yes, that does allow for up to 15% more performance, but still the 970 has a dismal showing here, crippled by its VRAM setup, and um, yeah, I think it's unlikely that the Vulkan API has a state-of-the-art implementation on the older architecture. Also remember that any GPU purchased now, well, you kind of expect it to last for two or three years. And this bumps into the arrival of the next-gen consoles where we should expect memory requirements to rise once again. And yes, we should expect developers to embrace uh, adoption of low-level APIs like DX12 and Vulkan more comprehensively. In the here and now, I actually still rate the 970, but it's interesting to note that across the fullness of time, the 980 has actually proven more adept at keeping pace. For 970 owners looking to keep on tracking with their hardware, you may find that dropping texture quality will yield big returns. For me, my requirement for an upgrade is a good 80% plus of extra performance stock versus stock. And based on Crisis 3, a game that really doesn't like Turing, it's kind of worst case scenario. Well, this takes us into RTX 2070 territory. And I'd say that on more modern games, a 2060 will provide a great boost at a decent price. And of course, you get ray tracing features and all of the other Turing loveliness on top of the rasterization performance advantages. But yeah, obviously that does come with its own price implications. So let's wrap this up then. Think of the 1660 as a turbo-powered 980 or GTX 1060 with the potential to grow even more powerful in the short term via overclocking or in the longer term when its forward-looking architectural features are utilized uh, more comprehensively by developers. It's a good performer for its price point for sure, but if your budget can stretch to 1660 Ti or better yet 2060, 
can't help but feel that those products are significantly more future-proof. For AMD, price adjustments on both Vega 56 and RX 590 are required to bring those back into contention. I mean, they're still good products, it's just price too high at the moment. Okay, so that's all from me for now. Please do like and subscribe to support the work we do. And of course, please ring the bell for instant notifications whenever a new DF video appears on the channel. And take a look at the DF Patreon for pristine quality video downloads and a chance to support the kind of work we do more directly. But that's all from me for now. For now and for always, in fact, thanks for watching.